Hey everyone, welcome to Last Week on the Weekly Windup. My name is Adam Strawn and here are the topics that we're going to go through today. So we have reviews. We have reviews of Deadpool and Wolverine. So here are all about our thoughts about that. We also have Fly Me to the Moon, a film starring Channing Tatum and Scarlett Johansson. And we'll talk a little bit about that movie as well. You might not have even heard of it. We're also going to talk about the series The Boyfriend on Netflix, and we're also going to talk about Marvel news. Yes, we're obviously going to discuss Robert Downey Jr. being cast as Doctor Doom, which blows my mind, but we're also going to talk about a horrific scandal exposed at San Diego Comic-Con this year, which is wild. We'll also talk about Jamie Lee Curtis being an icon, in my opinion, in her response to Marvel, which was brilliant. And we'll also talk about the Olympics and specifically the tennis, which is my absolute favorite. And then we'll end with the album of the week, my recommendation. All right, let's get into it. All right, so Deadpool and Wolverine. Overall, it's safe to say that I really enjoyed this movie. Now, was it perfect? Absolutely not. But was it fun? Hell yeah, like in many different ways. Just seeing Hugh Jackman and Ryan Reynolds together, like playing off each other as this buddy cop energy was like really fun. And it was fun with like Wolverine's like serious tone of like, his trauma he was going through compared to like Deadpool talking and taking the piss out of everything. And it was really funny in places. Like some of the jokes that they got in were really like risque as well. Like Hugh Jackman's divorce, which I did not expect to hear that, that but that was hilarious. And there was some great fight sequences in this as well, especially to the backdrop of Madonna Like a Prayer. That's like my favorite Madonna song of all time. So for that to be in this movie, yes, give me that please. And the cameos some real big surprises in there. I, obviously, I'm not going to reveal any of them in case you haven't seen it, but some big shocks. Now, where it fell flat for me was that it felt more like a museum and walking around at like the spectacles inside. Like, there's a cameo. Oh, and there's a cameo. And, oh, look, another cameo. But like, once you take all of that like fan service away and like the, all of that shock value of seeing who's going to pop up next, the story is just a little meh. There were some great emotional performances in there, especially from Hugh Jackman. And I loved the ending, it felt like really wholesome and I was intrigued to see how it's gonna tie into the MCU directly from the ending. But some of those cameos, I have to say like, I absolutely gasped when I saw some of them. And I also got this, it had to be done, we got this. Yep, that's right, we got the popcorn bucket. And look at it, it's absolutely epic. It's got like, the, I don't know if you can see the little tongue inside the mouth there, and it's actually textured, it has like a weird feeling to it. And obviously, you know, you put your hand in there to get the popcorn. But yeah, you know what, it was just, it's iconic. It had to be done. And I love as well, it says on here, can also be used for popcorn right at the bottom there. What else could it be used for? All right, so next up, we went to see Fly Me to the Moon. Now. Me and my partner have AMC Stubbs subscription and often we like check out what's playing at cinemas and we go and check out like a random movie we might not have normally like seen because, well, why the hell not? It's included in our subscription, right? This has led us to catching some really great movies and then the kind of movies that we might not have initially thought, oh, we'll pay like just solo money to go and see. But then it's led to stuff like The First Omen, which was incredible. Late Night with the Devil, which is one of my favorite movies, like, amazing. So we went to see Fly Me to the Moon and you know it's got Channing Tatum, Scarlett Johansson. We thought all right let's check it out. It was just all right. <laughs> Basically Channing Tatum's character works at NASA and it's the space race for who will get to the moon first. They want this to be a huge deal like everywhere they want people talking about this and Woody Harrelson's character he hires Scarlett Johansson to promote the hell out of it on TVs to get everyone talking about it like literally America they want them in the spotlight they want to be the first ones onto the moon. So he hires Scarlett Johansson, who's very good at doing this, like publicizing stuff really, to get it out there. It also does explore the concept of the moon landing being faked, and it has some interesting moments here and there, but God, this movie feels so long. I remember like clock watching through this thinking, okay, now it's gonna end. And then it carried on and again and again and again. I was like, come on. And I don't really feel the romance between Channing Tatum and Scarlett Johansson here either. It was just, I don't know, like, it had its moments, but, and it was fun in places, I guess, but you could just have easily shaved off 30 minutes from the movie and you wouldn't have felt the difference. I probably wouldn't have gone to see it if we didn't have the subscription, but yeah, if you want to check it out, it's very easy watching. It's got some interesting light moments, but honestly, probably worth it to come to like subscriptions on TV or something, but it's inoffensive. It was nice. All right, next, we're going to move on to something which is a huge hit with me, the series The Boyfriend on Netflix. Did any of you guys watch this? Well, for anyone who hasn't heard of it, The Boyfriend 
Boyfriend is a Japanese gay dating slash big brother like reality show, but it's not like Love Island or any anything like that. It's a lot more cutesy, but it's also just really nice. Basically, there's the house and they all live in it called the green room. And at the beginning, we see them all enter the house. It's very much like Big Brother where they all come in like one at a time and they all get to know each other. They like announce their name and like they start chatting. It, it is that section of it is really a lot like Big Brother. And they all end up living in the house together. They cook together, they hang out together, and they all have like their own single bedrooms as well. And yeah, like it's really nice just watching the dynamic of all of them coming together. But they have like camera confessionals as well, a bit like Big Brother, where they're talking about like the interactions that they've had with like certain members and like whether they start developing feelings for one another. And while they're there, one of them is nominated each episode to work in the coffee truck, which I'll explain in a second. But then that person gets to choose another person of who they want to work with them that day. And then the two of them, they get in the truck, they drive to a location next to the beach, like away from the house. And they basically just work a shift where they make coffee and they sell coffee and like snacks and that to people like basically down by the beach. And that money that they make goes towards like their weekly budget for food that they're gonna buy for that week. It's cute. And they get to know each other like away from everybody else. And it's really nice, especially if like, one of them start to develop feelings for the other one. They just get to take them in the truck and go and have like a day away with them. It's like, it's super nice. They also have date nights when they get to sleep in a nicer hotel away from the house together. And guys, it has had a grip on me because they're just really endearing. The drama between Dai and Shun, I'm obviously, I'm not going to say any spoilers here. Go and check it out. But the drama, Shun, the drama. And Jesus, I need to go over that with someone when more people have watched it because there's so much of it. Yusek is hot as hell. Jesus Christ, what an attractive man who is genuinely nice as well and is like a go-go dancer. That's kind of my type as well. I go for like the nice guys and he's really nice, ripped as hell, beautiful. And yeah, see all everything of what happens with him as well. But check it out if it is your thing. I was really into it. And as well, Japan's never really had a gay dating show like this. I think it's like the first ever. So good for them. Make sure you check it out. All right, now into the Marvel news and Doctor Doom and the news with Robert Downey Jr. So for anyone who somehow has missed this living under a rock, Robert Downey Jr. has been confirmed to be playing Doctor Doom in the new forthcoming Avengers movie, Avengers Doomsday. And the Russo brothers are back to direct, which... Seems like we're going back to old territory here, which is what made the MCU really popular, that lead up to like Endgame. But all three of them are going to work on Avengers Secret Wars 2, and it's confirmed that the Russos are being paid $80 million to come back, and then Robert Downey Jr. significantly more. That's a quote there. That's wild. I'm a little conflicted about this, I'm not going to lie. So like, I want to wait and see the final product. Obviously, I have trust in the Russo brothers. Obviously, Robert Downey Jr. will give an amazing performance. But at the same time, it seems like Marvel are just in the phase of like, oh, this thing that you loved, remember? Remember that thing? Well, we're bringing it back. Look, it's, it's right back here for you. We're bringing back Robert Downey Jr. We're bringing back the directors and Spider-Man. Look at all these Spider-Men that you used to love. And like, you know, even the most recent Deadpool and Wolverine movie, very much the same. And I know what everyone's talking about. Well, wait, hold on. Everyone, you know, shot down Heath Ledger when they said he was cast as the Joker, blah, blah, blah. But this is different. Like. Heath Ledger hadn't played another character in Batman Begins and then was brought back as the Joker. Like, that's different. Like, we're not questioning whether Robert Downey Jr. can play the role well. It's that they're bringing him back even though he was Iron Man. It just feels like a strange move from Marvel, but, you know, I'll be there to see it when the movies come out because I'm super intrigued and I'm so invested this far. I've watched everything they put out, so I'll definitely be there. Plus, I love Robert Downey Jr. He's such a talented actor, so I'm absolutely going to be there, even if this does feel like, I don't know, a little bad. Speaking of, I love this from the outset. So Jamie Lee Curtis, the scandal with Marvel right now. So Jamie Lee Curtis recently made news when she was asked what phase she thought Marvel were in right now. And she replied with, bad. <laughs> I just think that's incredible. She's not wrong. Like it hasn't been a strong since Endgame. Like really it has kind of taken a you know downward trajectory. And I think it's hilarious. And a lot of the movies, as we said, like Quantum Mania, like has not been great. But she has issued an apology, even if I kind of wish she didn't and that she didn't have to. But here's what she said. So she issued an apology and she said, My comments about Marvel were stupid and I will do better. I've reached out to Kevin Feige and will no longer play in that mud-slinging sandbox of competition we call the internet. 
nor will I engage in the toilet paper promotion or gameplay that is designed for clicks, not content or conversation. Now again, I know why she's replying and I know why she's making the apology, but still. But I love that Ryan Reynolds himself also passed comment on this and he kind of backed her up by saying, wait, is everyone expected to apologize for slamming Marvel post Endgame? I think that's brilliant and I think he's absolutely right. Also, he took the piss out of Marvel so much in Wolverine and Deadpool, so like, He's totally right. I don't think the apology was needed, but obviously I understand why she's done it, right? But yeah, I just think that's hilarious. All right, let's talk about the San Diego Comic-Con scandal. Now, this is insane. So speaking of all things Marvel, obviously San Diego Comic-Con is where we recently learned about Robbie Downey Jr. becoming Doctor Doom. However, in horrendous news, 14 people were arrested for being involved in a sex trafficking sting there. Like, what? This is absolutely insane. Of all the places, never thought we'd hear about this at San Diego Comic-Con. 10 victims were recovered from it and California Attorney General Rob Bonta had this to say, quote, Unfortunately, sex traffickers capitalize on large-scale events such as Comic-Con to exploit their victims for profit. These arrests send a clear message to potential offenders that their criminal behavior will not be tolerated. We are grateful to all our dedicated partners of old in the San Diego Human Trafficking Task Force, whose collaboration has been invaluable. This is actually crazy. There are thousands, thousands of people who attend every single year from around the world to enjoy their fandom together alongside other people. And the fact that there's people there, like seedy, horrendous people who look to capitalize and prey on people, that's absolutely mad. And like, if you asked me this like a week before learning this news, I would have never ever said, oh yeah, San Diego Comic-Con. But like, who knows how long this has been going on for? But thank God, like now it's been caught and it's been dealt with. And this sends a message as well to stop this happening in the future. That's just wild. But not all doom and gloom about San Diego Comic-Con and the announcements there. I do want to highlight two specific things that I am really, really excited for. There's a lot of things that came out, a lot of great stuff, but two things in particular I am super pumped for. And for people that know this podcast, I have to talk about this one. Invincible Season 3 is coming and we got the reveal of the new suit, finally. Like, comic fans, you already know about it, but it's so nice to see that. There's no release date yet, but... They have confirmed a season four is on the way too. And like, yes, I am absolutely all over this. Love that they've confirmed it already. Let's get it out quickly though. Let's not have a huge wait between. And yeah, check out the podcast already if you haven't realized that we've covered every single episode of Invincible, season one and season two and the Adam Eve episode. Get on that, check it out. I also want to talk about a new show called Teacup. It's a new horror show from Ian McCulloch, who's the producer on Yellowstone, and James Wan, who you'll know from The Conjuring, Malignant and Aquaman. And it's based on the novel Stinger by Robert McCammon. Now, this follows a group of people in rural Georgia who must come together in the face of a mysterious threat in order to survive. Anything horror-wise in a TV show, and I'm pretty much already in, I'm not going to lie, like I'm already there. And to have these people involved, I am super interested. Like James Wan as well, super excited for this. I am ready for it. All right, now we're moving into tennis at the Olympics. I'm going to talk about the following things. The Coco Golf drama, Nadal and Alcaraz both as doubles players and then separately, and Andy Murray's big, big news that came after this. First of all, my absolute favorite tennis player in the world is Carlos Alcaraz, and he's doing incredible. You guys, I am obsessed with this man. Like, not only is he absolutely beautiful, Demapel, Carlos. Vamos. but he's also one hell of a tennis player. And he's come back like this year in such a big way, like winning Wimbledon and like, you know, the other wins that he's had. And he's doing really well here as well. And I really hope he gets that gold. He's in the final now, which is amazing. He's just playing incredibly well in the Olympics. And honestly, I am right behind him. Hey everyone, Adam here from the future. So as of time of recording, the final has already happened between Novak Djokovic and Carlos Alcaraz. And Djokovic actually won. So big congratulations to him. So well-deserved. It's the medal that he has always wanted. And also, yes, a big congratulations to Alcaraz as well, because yeah, he got to the final in like his first Olympics, so that's amazing. Anyway, now back to the video. It was super exciting to see him partnering with Rafa Nadal as well. I know like since he's been young, he's always wanted to like play alongside Nadal, so this is incredible. They did start off well together as doubles partners, but unfortunately they were knocked out by the American team of Kracek and Ram. Now, 
This feels iconic to have just seen them play together. I know like it would be amazing to see them win a medal, see them even win gold, but to see them play together is just fantastic. And honestly, we'll, we'll see what happens with Nadal's like career after this. I know that he was beaten by Djokovic. Obviously, he's out of the singles as well. He has talked potentially about retirement. He hasn't confirmed anything yet, but we'll see. But honestly, two icons there, right there, Djokovic and Nadal playing against each other. Incredible. All right, so Coco Goff, she had a really hard time in her singles match and was reduced to tears during the second set with her opponent's shot being called out. And then it was corrected and called back in by the umpire. Now, she did argue that the point should have been replayed, but the umpire stood by their decision. Basically, she was saying that she was like, the way she leaned back was because she heard the shot before she hit the ball. The umpire tried to argue and say, no, you hit the ball, and then it was called. So I'm not too sure which one was which there, but you know, but he was trying to say that her shot wasn't affected by the late call. Goff then stated, quote, there's been multiple times this year where that happened to me, where I feel like I always have to be an advocate for myself on the court. I have to say, like, tennis is my favorite sport of all time. Obviously, I'm not pro by any means, but it is super tough out there on players when this type of thing happens. Like, everything's happening at high speed. Like, there's a lot riding on a single shot between often winning or losing or, like, gaining advantages. And we've seen this affect players every single year, men and women. You know, and it's just, the frustrations can get high. Like, we're all human at the end of the day. I've done that when I've been playing on the court. Like, it can happen. But I just hope that she comes back from it in the next tournament, she dominates. Like we've seen her do before. Like she's incredible, like Coco Goff. She's absolutely phenomenal. I remember Venus Williams, again, love the Williams sisters, when she played her one year and she said, oh, it feels like I'm watching a young me out there. One of the biggest compliments in the world. Honestly, she's one hell of a player and I know she'll come back from this. And finally, Andy Murray announces his retirement after his time ended in the Olympics. Now, Andy Murray, this, He's an icon. Like a lot of players have shown their support for Andy as well, but I have to highlight Andy's incredible tweet after this, which says it all. So afterwards, Murray tweeted, never even liked tennis anywhere. I mean, that's just, that highlights his sense of humor. It's just, that's epic. Now, I remember watching Andy win Wimbledon for the first time when I was back home and like, I've followed his career since then. I watched him twice when he won Wimbledon and like, that was amazing. I remember just him coming on as this young kid, building himself up and then, to watch that and like follow his career like that has been phenomenal. So Andy, enjoy your retirement. You've been phenomenal. All right, over to the album of the week now. And we're going to talk about the album from 2012. This is phenomenal. This is Weather Systems by Anathema. I absolutely love this album. I love this album. Anathema, in case you don't know, they're from the UK. They are disbanded now. They're kind of doing like their own separate thing, the band members. But I love this album. I remember the first time I ever heard it, I sat down and I just listened to it all the way through. And I was like, wow, like it feels like this was literally made for me. Untouchable part one, part two. One of the best openings to any album ever in the world. I will say that until I'm dead. Like that opening, those two songs, brilliant. It's like, it's the same song twice, but played very differently. Like the male vocal on the first track, like with the female vocal supporting, change that around in the second one brilliant also the song sunlight on the album is absolutely gorgeous like that gives me like chills when i listen to it but yeah go and listen to the album listen to track one and two untouchable part one and part two if that doesn't do it for you straight away then i don't know what else to tell you because i think that starts off so strong and it just it's incredible. Check it out. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. So that's been the weekly wind up. Let me know your thoughts about all of the news that's happened this week, anything else that might have happened that I haven't covered. And as well, let me know your thoughts all about that album. I really want to know what you think about that because I absolutely love it and I am always here for it. And I know a side project, they are going to do an Untouchable Part 3, some of the band members who have come back together. So I'm already here for that. Cannot wait to hear that. All right, everyone. Take care and until next time.